talk about social systems design right now. And before we start, I want to share this uh, poem with you. And you may have heard it before. It's called Message from Hopi Elders. And I think when we talk about permaculture, it stands for permanent agriculture and permanent culture, right? And how to create a new culture and how to look for our... Okay. <laughs> how to look for our, um, how to look to our elders. And so I thought this would be appropriate and appropriate for what we're, we're talking about and what we're trying to create in this space and what we're trying to create as a community. So again, this is called Message from Hopi Elders. You have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour and there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be a good time. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open, and our heads above the water. See who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the world's struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. It doesn't say. It's Oribe, Arizona, Hopi Nation. So I thought I'd start with that because that is about you know, we are creating here, over the weekend, a small community and a small container uh, that who knows what this will all lead to. And permaculture is not only about the plants in the landscape, it's about the people. It's about people care and taking care of people. And community is uh, a big and fundamental part of that. Because it's not only the permanent agriculture, it's the permanent culture. And Patrick Whitefield, who wrote those two books, a project will never fail because the land is poor. It will fail because the people will fail to get along. And that is definitely the case. The plants are fine. You plant some stuff in the ground, sure, maybe the bulls get them every once in a while, the gophers or whatever, right? But the plants, for the most part, the landscape that you put in will be fine. Things want to grow, things want to generate, seeds want to sprout. It's the social systems that fail. And that makes the landscape that you design fail. So, it hasn't been... So social systems design is the application of permaculture principles to human relationships, communities, social systems, and networks. Right? So we're going to take these principles and we're going to break them down on a social level. And in the past, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren started by saying this permanent, permaculture stands for permanent agriculture. But then they realized that the social systems are so much a part and inherent to the success of a landscape that that's when they put in permanent culture as well. And I think we, we never put enough emphasis on the social systems 
And in the past, permaculture design courses haven't put a lot of emphasis on it. Because it's the, you know, it's the like touchy-feely stuff and the community stuff, and we don't want to go there. We want to like take an excavator and move some earth around and plant some trees. You know, that's a lot more tangible than the hard work of what David, Dave Jackie, who wrote Edible Forest Gardens, calls the inner landscape work. That's the hard work, right? That's the stuff that we have to do. And if you've put in these systems, if you've even put in a garden, you run up against your own stuff, right? It's not perfect. I failed. I need to do that better. Why didn't that work, right? And so it's an opportunity to learn, and it's an opportunity to grow, you know, as you're growing your garden. So in permaculture, you take that zone system that we just covered before dinner, right? And zone zero zero is actually the self. So zone zero is the house, but zone zero is this thing right here. Zone zero becomes your partners, your spouses, the people that you see on a daily basis, that you interact with on a daily basis, those relationships that you have to maintain and care for on a daily basis. Zone one are the friends and other family that you see probably on a weekly basis, you go out to coffee with a friend or something like that. Zone two are your neighbors, your work colleagues, you know, clubs that you go to maybe on a monthly basis. Zone three are communities of interest, friends of friends. Zone four is national and zone five is global. So you can see how this can be applied at a social level. So it's not only in the landscape where you, know, you want your kitchen, garden, and herbs really close in because that's what you deal with on a daily basis. There's a social level to this and a care that you take. And this is all broken down in that book, People and Permaculture, which is right here. Luby McNamara, who's from the UK, really broke down a lot of this in terms of taking the permaculture principles and applying them. Um, to creating community and to doing some of that um, inner work. So what I thought we would do is on your, we're going to go inside. And I, <laughs> if you didn't expect to be doing this, well, I'm sorry, but this is how it goes. So page seven. Yes. Yeah, there, I think right on the table there. Yeah, sorry, honey. And Steve, do you want one too? Do you have, so page seven, I just want you to take a moment. So on page seven you have, say, observe and interact. What do I see or feel in myself? What is my body feeling? What's my intuition saying? So again, we, and I can speak from personal experience, I'm okay with wandering around the property and observing what's going on on the property, right? I don't take very much time to actually, you know, we want to always be productive. And especially where, when we're in these spaces where we're actually producing or we're growing, we get pulled into always being productive. So the observe and interact and actually looking inside to be like, how am I feeling? What's going on? You know, that is important. I remember, uh, a friend of mine saying, she's like, I was telling her, oh, you know, I haven't done this with my business and this, I wanted to do this and I didn't get it done. Da, 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 da. She's like, I wanted you to take a sheet of paper and I want you to write down all the successes that you've had in your business this year. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And she's like, let me explain it to you in ecological terms so that you will understand. She's like, you say this all the time, you know, you you're not going to produce tomatoes from a garden and take and take and take from that soil and not replenish that soil and expect those tomatoes to produce just as well the next year. Same thing. If you're celebrating your successes, if you're celebrating your community, you are fertilizing your soul and yourself in terms of these are the successes that I had this year, rather than oh, everything went wrong and I didn't do this and I didn't do that. It's the same kind of term. And when she, when she described it in that way, I was like, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. Of course, I would feed more compost to the soil next year. You know, that makes a lot of sense. But we don't oftentimes 
connect that to how we are. We are nature working, right? We are a natural system. And so we need to do more of that. Um, so, and so I'd like you to take just five minutes, well, let's give you seven, and go through these questions. Like, produce no waste. Where is my time being wasted? You know, what are areas my life would benefit from more diversity? Just take a little bit of time to fill this out, and then I'm going to have you get into groups and just share a couple of your thoughts or what came out of it. So how, how was that? Anybody want to share anything that struck you? Steve? Workshops are really hard because I have to talk to people I don't know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no. That, I understand that. I love, that's why I'm the one up here. No, as an introvert, right, that, that can be an issue for sure in terms of community building and social systems design. You know, and I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Having a business, I used to be super shy as a kid. Like, I didn't talk to anybody. My, the, my parents took me to a therapist, and they, the therapist said that I was slow. Because I, ta I didn't talk to my kindergarten teacher. I didn't talk to, I had some, my fifth grade teacher called me Karen for the first, like, three months before parent-teacher interviews because I was too afraid to tell her that my name was Kareen. So I get it, you know, in those types of situations. So I think being aware of different people, that there are introverts, there are extroverts, there are people that kind of get filled up by the community and this type of situation, but then sometimes it drains people's energy. So knowing that, too, is important. So when we talk about, okay, what kind of social systems design are we going to have for this space, right? Is it going to be a retreat center? Is it going to be something where people come here on a regular basis? Because if they come here on a regular basis, do you actually want to deal with people all the time? You know, so, right. <laughs> so there are two introverts living on this land, but they want to kind of build community, but kind of don't want to always be there. You know, so like those are really, things to be aware of, you know, going in. Like, you have to be realistic. Or it's that, well, can I interface with somebody else over here who's the manager who does bring in the community and they do most of that work, right? While me and Steve are over here just chilling out, you know? Well, not chilling out. You're doing a bunch of other things. But so those are things that people need to think through way more than they do. Um, because one of the biggest things that I see go wrong is it's just way too much work, right? So, for example, on our property, when it was me, my stepson, and my partner, that worked fine, you know, Taylor helped out, my partner worked out, helped out, I worked out, but Taylor has now gone off to university and he lives away from home. So a lot of the work that he used to do, I need to fill in that gap. Like, I can't do it all. So is it me having through my business volunteers that come on a weekly basis that learn from me or that they intern with me? Those are things that I'm starting to th th think through because Taylor just moved out this fall. So that's a real important part. And don't discount that because what happens is if you do discount that, then you just get burned out from maintaining that system. And it's a lot of work. And it's... Agriculture was inherently a community process. And now we've kind of taken that away. I have the same issues with getting work done on our project. We used to have interns, but now we, we don't attract people who will stay longer. Than, but we actually get a lot of volunteers from the community, so we actually rely on getting our work done with volunteers. People come from France for three weeks yeah. to, to figure out, you know, they're building a greenhouse. So I had a, an engineer who said three weeks from me from France, yeah. uh, and he built all the trellises on my on my forest garden. And, right. And he was the best, has the most best work ethics I've ever seen, you know. Nice. So, you know, you, sometimes you, you, the system's just fade in and out. Yes. Uh, interns just don't work because, you know, usually young kids now, they just, 
they just don't have any work ethic. <laughs> we were talking about that at dinner. Have, mostly males that don't have work ethics. Or they, they, they can get jobs somewhere else. So that yeah. it's not a, a value to them to volunteer their time anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so that's, that's the issue that I, we've had. And, and these, these things need, need a lot of tender care. They, these systems, you know, they really need a lot of work and attention to detail. Uh, we used to teach people, oh, you're going to put this forest garden in. And don't worry about it. You, it'll, it'll just be producing, and you never have to do anything. Yeah. That's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a lie. Bill Mollison once was like, and then the designer becomes the recliner. And that is a lie. That is a big fat lie. Maybe in 10 years, but not initially. You know, for the installation and for the maintenance, you need to put in an initial amount of time. But that's great. That's that whole self-regulate and accept feedback. It could be that interns worked at one point, but they don't anymore, and now you do work big work parties and volunteer parties to get your work done. You know, those, that's an evolving thing as well. And I think, so what I wanted to do next was talk about, so on the inner landscape level, we can look at these questions and kind of ponder those ourselves, right? But then we can also bring those principles to community level, right? So this whole idea of the problem is the solution, well, there's a ton of growth and development in Bozeman, which it sounds like there's stuff going on here in Kalispell too, and it's on some of the best agricultural land in the valley. Right, so is this an opportunity to create agrihoods on that agricultural land? Right, is that a social system that we can, can we convince a developer that it is economically viable, or he's gonna make a bunch of money, or she's gonna make a bunch of money, if you actually put in a system where there's a neighborhood that's designed around a community garden area? You know, if you can get something like that to fly and it's economically viable, is that an option? So Davis, uh, what is it called? Village Homes in Davis, California is a perfect example of that. It's an architect who 35 years ago had this idea where he created this neighborhood where there are fruit trees growing everywhere and it's more of a bikeable area so kids have their, you know, their kids can go run around and not worry about traffic it's a neighborhood feel to it and then there are ladders in random locations that you can take and go up and harvest apples or well there in California there who knows some delicious something else um, so so that whole model and all that whole system now that is an area that people want to move to right? uh, and granted that's more for an affluent People, so you know we have to think through those social systems as well. Or each element performs multiple functions. Sorry, Joe. Um, you have a block party that's not only a garage sale. Maybe you're painting a mural. You're having conversations and connecting with your neighbors and talking about how to make the neighborhood better. So again, it's a community building event, but it has multiple yields from it. So I, through my business, I hold potlucks during the growing season. So once a month during the growing season, we get together. I send it out to my newsletter list. Anybody who wants to come can come. We usually go to somebody's property. So they get to see some other way that people are designing or growing. We come together. I have everybody introduce themselves and share an offer and an ask if they have it, you know, if they have anything to offer the group or if they need anything they need anything from the group, I need manure, I need some straw, I need some plants, I have some plants. And so, again, it's not about, it's not only about the beneficial relationships that are created between the plants, right, where we have the nitrogen fixers and the nutrient accumulators, it's the beneficial relationships that are created between people. It's the networks. That's what creates a resilient community, right, is creating more networks of people that are connected to one another. If you know your neighbors, and you talk to your neighbors, you can ask for forgiveness instead of permission. No, but, but <laughs> that, that whole idea of creating community is what you wanna, wanna do, because you can't be mad at people that you know, or you can have conversations with people you know. You can really create, easily create the other if you never know them or take the opportunity to know them. So produce no waste, so in Bozeman we do have 
this company called Happy Trash Can, and there's a, another company that's also doing this, a curbside composting service that picks up residential and restaurant food waste, uh, and then it turns it into compost, and they, the members themselves get some compost back to go into their garden. So again, that's a social systems design, a permaculture design uh, that's, that's an economically viable as well. And I'd love it, um, Mark, right? If you share just your little thing where the farmer comes and grazes, that whole thing. And yeah, I, uh, up on the ranch, I've been really working on not drilling crops with any fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides. And I have a guy that comes in, he pays me 3,500 bucks to uh, winter his cattle and calf out in, in my crowds. And he put 600,000 pounds of organic matter on my barley field last year. So. So, plus the 3,500 bucks is exactly what it cost us to grow our 45-acre crop. So we got a crop that didn't cost us a bit because what he paid me, and then he does all the fertilizing for me. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So those are the types of systems like that by making connections with local organizations, companies, individuals that you want to start to make. I mean, this whole workshop is an intention to network as well, you know, to see how many connections we can make with the community here that can be connected to Steve and Cindy, that can be connected to one another and to, to, to um, bring together all of those ideas. So what I thought we would do is in your, to make it simple, in those same groups, if you can take your, I'd love to see, I'd love to mine you all for information see what, <laughs> right? But in a really good way, in a really good way. So, so go back to the principles, look at those principles and think about the social systems, like the Center for Sustainability is a social system design, right? What works, what doesn't. You know, think of the social systems in, on page two and three, those are the, the permaculture principles. Look at those principles and think of social systems in your life that you might be connected to, that you might be a part of, that might use, that might fill, fulfill these principles like I've done here. Or just share a couple examples and then I'd love for us to share some really good social systems examples with the group. Does that make sense? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Not applicable. Not What what do you mean by that? Yeah. So so maybe in your life, so for example, a great a great social system design that we have in Bozeman is that there is the Spring Creek Communal Garden. And it is a community garden, but not everybody has their separate plot. It's farmed as a communal space. And so there's one individual, one man, who has this three acres who wanted a garden, but understood very quickly that it was too much work just to garden alone. So he started to gather people around him. And so it's a great design because he has the land. He's also retired. But he has about 30 people that pay a nominal fee, like 25 bucks for the growing season that helps with the seeds. And so people come together, and there's a whole schedule of what needs to be done when they communicate with one another through a listserv, through an email listserv, so they know what needs to be done when. And that way, you can take off for two weeks in the summer. And that somebody else is taking care. And they participate in the harvest, and they participate in the preservation, and they have potlucks once a week. So that's an example of a social system where and it's not like that's, that's perfect. There are definitely issues with it, but it's been going on now for over a decade. And you know, part of it, the success of it is because this retired man has some capital and some time. But part of the success is that people love it because it's community. And they don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, my individual garden, who am I going to get to water this? You know, I'm going to grow all this food and it's going to go to waste, that kind of thing. So I'm certain that somewhere, and it doesn't have to do necessarily with gardens. 
you know, any kind of social system that you've seen work really well together, whether it's a nonprofit that works well, or maybe it's simply that you have, you know, as an example in permaculture of, you know, each function being supported by multiple elements. If you have children, maybe you have three babysitters that you can call on. Because if one can't make it, then you have two more that you can call on, right? So it's that whole resilience in the system and looking at those principles and then applying them kind of to the social realm. So what I want to come out of this is just a few more examples because there are things like what Mark shared with me at dinner. Like, that's brilliant. You know, that other people here who have land might be able to benefit from that kind of system. It might not look exactly that way, but, it, but there, that's the seed of an idea. Okay, it worked on that, or on that level where you have a lot of people getting together, but why isn't there another village home? Have you ever seen another village home? Right. Okay. We were hired by a developer in, in the Roaring Fork Valley to do a village home. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really a top, that was more of a top down. What, what was the magic in village homes that made that thing work? Yeah. Uh, so we were hired by a developer. We, were, we built a greenhouse. It's in my book. It's in mm -hmm. Roaring Gardens. And they developed a, a sustainable village on a, on a 200 acre ranch. Uh, and we spent Six months developing, we built a greenhouse and a, and a community garden. That was the perk. Right. Instead of a, a tennis court or you know, a swimming pool or something, it was a community garden and mm -hmm. a community greenhouse. And they never sold a lot. And this is in the Royal Fork Valley, right on 82. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just wound up selling the property to a polo field. Wow. And now they're bulldozing the entire thing. They, we've got the greenhouse there, it's still there as like a little module, but they're leveling everything and putting a polo field there. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what, what do you think went wrong there? Well, we, we are only involved in building the greenhouse and some of the preliminary design. I just don't think, I think they were just uh, bean counters. And they really didn't have, they were bean counters, and they really didn't have in their hearts to really do something it seemed like it was good on paper, but they never sold any of the lots. So the whole thing, about three or four years later, it just was abandoned. Right. And the same thing happened to another project I get involved in, with, at, um, and I'll show you tomorrow. Uh, it was a community garden, mm -hmm. it was a community forest garden at a high-end development in, near Salida. Um, it was at the Maytag Ranch. Mm -hmm. um, Russ Maytag was an heir of Maytag. He hired me to, after he read Gaia's Garden, he hired me to develop a, 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 a one-acre forest garden as a centerpiece for a big ranch development. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll show the slides tomorrow. Um, it, it ran for 20 years, mm -hmm. and then the property got sold, and they bulldozed it. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, like that happened to those, that garden in L.A., remember yeah. that? Yeah. So it doesn't, it happens on a community level, but if you try to do it on a corporate level, you know, there's always this bottom line stuff. Mm. Priorities change. So two projects that I've worked on, and, and, and then the golf course project, the same thing. Mm -hmm. I got booted out of that. It was a permaculture golf course. Yeah. And when, when the chemical people found out about it, it's history. They wanted to change everything. So it's really hard to work on a, on a corporate level to do this. I agree. I think that a lot of the, the successes that you see are from the grassroots. Right. You know, from this one individual who wants to do good work and is like, hey, come join me, you know, for no other reason that he wants to, you know, eat some good food and make some friends, you know. So I think that, that that's part of it, for sure, that you have to look at what the value system is on which it's based. And I think that gets back to kind of the inner landscape work of why you're doing what you're doing. Because I've definitely run into individuals who are like, I'm going to sell these earth ships in the Yellowstone Club because there's so much money there and I can sell these 6,000 square foot earth ships, which is completely counter to everything that you're wanting, the value system that you're trying to promote in permaculture. But it does, yeah, it's the bottom line. So that's about shifting culture, 
You know, and that's, I think, you know, that's, that is the long game. You know, that we have to kind of, and don't get me wrong, I'm a cynic and jaded on, on the one end, but I think I'm also kind of keep on reminding myself it's the long game. You know, that we do this work and we keep on doing this and we keep on teaching this and we grow gardens and they might get bulldozed and we grow some more and we plant some more and we keep on doing this because it is, we don't know what the long-term impact is going to be. I mean, obviously you have more experience than I do with these types of things. And I think the bottom line, it's like, how do we change that conversation that the bottom line isn't just economics? That's that observe and interact piece, yeah. right? Like at a social level, it's like you're new to the community. You spend like a year or two figuring out the dynamics of what's working. And if you have an idea, you might spend some time researching whether that idea is already floating out there or somebody's already doing it or you know, giving the opportunity for other people to come into it. And I think in this culture especially, we are an individualistic culture and we are constantly with this kind of communal nature of how we're trying to recreate our world in a sense, we're battling against that because the individual is like, well, I have this idea and I'm gonna go it alone and this is what I'm gonna do and everybody get out of my way, you know? rather than back to the kind of like, well, I have, you know, I have some ideas, maybe I'll talk to this guy over here and this woman over here and let's see if we can collaborate in a way. Like this competitive, we're battling the individual, we're battling the competition uh, to be the bigger, the better, the one of the one, the, you know, la la la, rather than back to how can we collaborate? You know, this was, Cindy said this is perfect, this is the collaboration. You know, that she realized that she couldn't do this alone. They had this idea, but they needed to bring more people into it. And I think that that's what we forget. I mean, there's the, the, the um, expression, softly, softly, catch a monkey, right? Yeah. That, you know, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna beat people into submission around these things. And I think that, that that's one of the, the things that I think about or why I started my business too. It's like, just, Show them that it's a good time. And their kids will observe. Yeah. They might not, but their kids yeah. will. And uh, we start turning the tide. Well, and I think part of what we um, struggle with, you know, just as a society, right, is this sense of belonging. And one thing that I think, especially our youth and with social media, who under the, how is your time being wasted, said social media, Facebook, things like that, right? You know, that is becoming a real issue around, like, you, you don't really, one, one time I saw this interview with Wendell Berry, who I love, for those of you who don't know, he's a farmer, an activist, a poet, and everything, and he, somebody asked him, he's like, Barry, what do you think about these online communities that are being created? You know, you know, what's your take on that? Because Wendell Berry was always about, you know, the, the loss of the rural community because of the cons consolidation of farms. And he was like, let's, let's be clear. A community is a group of people that is connected geographically to a place. That yes, that is a sort of community, but that is very, very different than the people in this area that understand the water issues that you're dealing with, that understand you know, how this whole valley was created, that understand the you know, politics of this area. That is the community. And I think it is this slow, game of, you know, Wendell Berry always says, he's like, I'm always on the losing side. <laughs> what did he say? He, he's always on the losing side. Oh, yeah. But he's like, what, what else would I do? But if you don't spend too much energy at any given point along the way, you know, you're succeeding. Yeah. <laughs> right. If you don't burn yourself out. And I think the, the issue, too, is that there are so many good examples out there but we are not hearing about them. The media is getting, is giving us all of the bad news. 
because that's what sells and that's what the rate whatever that whole thing but there are so many good things that are going on in the permaculture realm you know that like you just think of all the little people everywhere on their farms and gardens doing you know meeting like this like we are you know there those are if you woke up to that every morning it would be a completely different world but that stuff is happening does that mean we're not going to start a Facebook page? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> we'll talk about it. We may. We may. I mean, <laughs> but that's that whole thing of tools in the toolbox, right? In permaculture, that it is like if it's used in the right context, it can become a force for organizing, for connecting with people, and for having an impact. You know, there are real advantages to what the internet has done in terms of global organizing what have you but we'll talk about the Facebook group <laughs> but I think that whole idea of that is ultimately what this is about what permaculture is about it's like it's that sense of belonging right we create a sense of belonging through experience and that's what we need to look to do more of I think when you have, when people have a sense of belonging, then they don't get isolated. Then they don't, you know, then depression rates are not as much. You know, then they're, then they're connected to people. So thinking about how, and agriculture is a really easy and great way to do that. You know, to bring people together through growing food and through eating food. Like we have, I have these potlucks every month and it's like this amazing meal that everyone contributed to, that it would have taken you hours to make yourself, but people come together through that. Um, and I think we discount the little, the little things, you know, and we have to keep our eye on that. I mean, it used to be that if you liked your neighbor, you went and talked to them. Now, if you like yeah. your neighbor, you leave them alone. Right. You or know? You call some, call the cops and tell them Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, that, that's, we have definitely lost that. Yeah. So I just wanted to end by permaculture systems, you know, in the social, on all levels, mean abundance in food, in relationships, in resources, and in experience. And just as we move into tomorrow, understand we are all designers. You know, we think, you know, you don't need to have some degree or have taken this long permaculture design course. You you designed, you know, how you set up, if you have a house, your living room area, or you put on, you picked out what you were, what you wore today. You know, we are inherent in us, our designs. You may not have the experience of a permaculture design, but you're designing your life every day, you know, and the choices that you make.